Today, we'll hear from three of our corporate leaders whose companies have made this pivot and are effectively gardening through the diversity and inclusion context, although I'm going to look for potentially either nods or shaking of heads. I'm sure all of you feel that there's still further to go. There's, there's more to do in this space. Uh, Manalee Dairet, partner at KPMG, which is the 2017 overall best employer for Asian Americans, among many other recognitions that were announced last night. He'll kick us off. Then we'll be pleased to hear from Amy Rosen, Country Managing Director and General Counsel at Telstra, uh, who was recognized last night for distinguished performance as a great employer for LGBT Asian employees. And then finally, Austin Fernandez, uh, Managing Director at Credit Suisse, which was announced last night as the 2017 Best Employer for Sponsorship for Asian American employees, among some other awards as well. So, Manalee, I'll pass the microphone to you, or I gather you're lavaliered up. Um, as was mentioned, we'll have uh, kind of an overview from all three of our panelists, each of our panelists. And then really, I hope this is a discussion-oriented group. Uh, hopefully, you've either come in with some things that are on your mind, or certainly the, the words that you're about to hear uh, will hopefully energize the remaining of our time for a great discussion and a give and take uh, with all of you. So, Manalee. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, is, is that, can I have that clicker yeah. over there? Just want to see if it works. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I thought I'd start by just talking a little bit about what diversity and inclusion mean to us at KPMG. Um, for us, it's a, those are strategic priorities for our organization. Um, they are integral to who we are as an organization and they are important to our core values of doing the right thing and doing it in the right way. Um, an important part of our strategy as a business is um, to bring value to our clients through innovation um, by bringing creative, out-of-the-box thinking to help solve our client's business problems. And so we see that diversity and inclusion is a foundation for how we build that culture of innovation within KPMG. Um, because when you, when you have a diverse and inclusive environment, for us, we believe that uh, that creates an environment where you have different perspectives, you have different points of view, um, and therefore, when you have an environment where different perspectives and different points of view are valued and are respected, um, that creates an environment where there is innovation, there is creativity. We also think that diversity and inclusion, when you have that kind of environment, it attracts high-powered um, top talent because they know that when they're in your organization, their perspectives are respected, their values are respected, and therefore they feel that they can contribute to the organization, and that helps them with their career. So diversity and inclusion are really important for us. They're part of who we are. At least we try to make it part of who we are. And as I said, there's work to do. Um, and then the other thing is because it's an important part of our strategy, um, we believe that it has to start from the top. So I thought I'd share with you just a few quotes from uh, some leaders at KPMG. Uh, Lynn Dowdy is our chairman and CEO. And Sue Townsend uh, is our diversity leader. I'm not going to read their quotes. You can read them for yourselves. But I thought I'd just uh, comment on a few points that they made. Uh, Lynn talks about how uh, diversity and inclusion are strategic priorities of KPMG. She talks about how it spurs innovation. And she talks about how it attracts and empowers talent. And uh, Sue mentions two things that I think are worth mentioning. She talks about how diversity and inclusion influence everything that we do. So what that means is that it permeates throughout our organization. It, it's part of how we operate as an organ, organization, and it's also part of how we serve our clients. The other thing that I think is worthwhile mentioning in Sue's uh, quote is that she talks about building a pipeline of diverse next generation leaders. So what diversity is, is it's not just about building diversity in certain pockets of your business. It's really about building diversity across the organization, throughout the entire organization, all the way up to the top. Having a set of leaders that are diverse as well. So what are, to us, what 
what's the difference between diversity and inclusion? So diversity to us is about each of us, and it's about our differences, our unique characteristics as individuals. Inclusion is about all of us, and it's about the collective value of our differences, and it's about respecting the differences, and it's about harnessing, in my mind, harnessing the power of the differences to create an environment where there is creativity, where there is innovation, and also to create an environment where um, your organization is far-reaching and broad. So at, at KPMG, we have seven uh, diversity networks. We have the African American Network, we have the Women's Network, we have the Hispanic Latino Network, we have the LGBT Network, we have the Network for Disabled Persons, we have Veterans Network, and we have um, the Asian Pacific Islander Network, or APEN. And so I thought I'd share with you some of the priorities that we've identified for APEN. And a lot of these priorities are consistent with KPMG's uh, diverse, diver, uh, diversity and inclusion priorities. The first one is to attract, retain, and develop our people. The second one is to support career ambitions. So that's creating uh, an, uh, an environment or fostering an environment where our people can advance their careers. And also building leadership amongst our diverse population and increasing the representation of diverse people in our leadership. The third is to identify credentialing experiences. What that means is helping diverse people gain the kinds of experience they need in order to advance their career. So for example, at KPMG, we have a program where we take a look at the makeup of the engagement teams serving some of our largest priority clients. Because we believe it's important for our diverse people to gain experience working in those large priority engagements. Um, on top of that, a lot of those large priority engagements are led by leaders of the firm. So it gives them the opportunity to interact and, have, and build relationships, whether they be mentoring or role model or sponsorship with some of our leaders. Um, the next one is about is creating meaningful networking opportunities. In our industry and in our firm, success is driven by relationships, relationships, relationships. That's what we always say. And so in APEN, one of our priorities is to provide opportunities for our members and other diverse people an opportunity to network and build meaningful, long-lasting relationships both internally within the firm as well as externally within the firm. So for example, we have a program called the Stacy Lewis um, Golf Outing Championship for uh, Rising Stars. For those of you who follow golf, Stacy Lewis is an LGPA champion. Um, we invite firm leaders to participate in that, uh, that, that outing. We invite women leaders in industry to participate in that outing. And we invite um, Stacy Lewis, obviously, and we invite um, high-performing uh, women, diverse as well as non-diverse, to participate in that outing. The idea is for them to be able to network with firm leaders, to be able to network with women leaders in industry, um, and gain relationships, whether it be mentoring or role model and so on. Um, and then the final point um, priority that we have is encouraging our leaders, our partners, and firm leaders to get involved in diversity and inclusion. Again, to build relationships for role modeling, mentoring, coaching, and, and so on. So for example, at, at uh, APEN, we have a national advisory board. That advisory board is comprised of firm leaders. We've invited both Asian and non-Asian firm leaders to be part of our board. Our vice chair of operation is part of that board. Our leader for innovation is part of that, uh, that board. Our leader for alliances is part of that board. Um, and then our leader for emerging markets is part of that board. Not all of them are Asian. Some of them are non-Asian. But the idea is to get them engaged in diversity and inclusion and to get them to be part of mentoring our people. So I thought I'd share some of our strategy. How do we execute our strategy? Um, you know, I've counted the number of programs and initiatives that we have at KPMG to support our diversity inclusion strategy, and there are dozens, dozens and dozens of them. Um, but they can be grouped into three main categories, recruiting, retention, uh, and talent development. 
and the examples that I have there are just a representative sample, obviously, of some of those programs. And I'm not going to go through each and every one of them. I don't know if I have the time. But in the recruiting area, to us, recruiting starts not at the point of someone is already a recruiter or candidate. It starts all the way back when they're still students, a graduate student, or a, an undergrad student. So for example, um, our Future Diversity Leaders Program is a program where we sponsor, on an annual basis, 75 diverse um, students. Uh, we we, we uh, give them scholarships and we um, offer them internships within KPMG. And um, if they are able to complete their internship successfully and if they maintain a good academic standing, they will receive an offer from KPMG at the end of their internship. Um, and many of our, um, our APEN members are um, mentors of some of these diverse students. Um, campus and recruiting uh, and experience higher recruiting, we, you know, our diverse uh, diversity networks are very much engaged in that. They present at our campus events, talking about what diversity means to KPMG, how you can get engaged, why is diversity so important at KPMG, and so on. And then uh, regularly, our experienced higher recruiters reach out to our uh, diversity network leaders for references uh, or for referrals for experienced hires. So for example, I think in 2016, about 34% of APEN's members um, referred hires through our experience higher recruiting. Um, I think I'll just touch on the senior talent uh, recruiting for a minute. What that means to us at KPMG is those are direct entry hires at the partner and managing, uh, managing director level. Um, again, here our senior talent recruiters regularly reach out to our diversity groups um, for referrals. And so for example, in uh, 2016, about 21% of our direct entry hires at the partner and managing director level were Asian. Retention to us is about coaching, it's about mentoring, and it's about helping our people overcome some of the challenges that they're experiencing uh, as part of their job. Um, we have a national mentoring program where we encourage all our people uh, to develop mentoring relationships uh, with anyone in the firm. Anyone who they identify with, they, you know, they are comfortable with, um, they respect, and so on. This is in addition to their uh, perf formal performance managers. Uh, and we also have a chairman's award for mentoring, uh, which we uh, give out uh, annually. And men mentees uh, nominate their, their mentors to, for the national uh, chairman's mentoring award. Uh, we have an employee engagement survey. Every year, we conduct a survey of our people to get feedback from our people about how do they feel uh, about working at KPMG. And we use the input from that survey to determine what we need to do, what programs we need to initiate within our diversity program. So for example, APEN takes the subset of the results of that survey for people who have identified themselves as Asian. And we use that information to determine, are there issues amongst the Asian population? How do they feel about working at KPMG? And then the, our, our, our advisory board um, uses that to determine what priorities we should have this coming year or the next two or three years. Um, I'll touch on the, the APEN Partner Outreach Program. What that is, is it's a recent program where we're pairing Asian partners with high-performing Asian senior managers or directors at the cusp of making managing director or at making partner. Um, and the idea here is to provide coaching, to prepare them for getting to the next level and also helping them get through the next threshold. And then the uh, Executive Insight for Pan-Asian Women is, a, is a, a program that we work with along with Ascend where we send two Asian women uh, high-performing uh, women who are um, part of KPMG to participate in this program along with other Asian women from other companies. And uh, the idea here is to help them overcome some of the challenges they're experiencing as they advance their careers. Talent development to us is about helping our people achieve their career objectives and building uh, a diverse set of leaders within KPMG. APEN Academy is a recent um, program that we have where we're building a curriculum for professional de development, for coaching, and for mentoring for our Asian population that touches every stage of their career. Uh, the National Associate and, and Senior Associate Credentialing Program is something that I touched earlier where we take a look at our 
uh, the engagement teams of our uh, priority accounts uh, to see that they're diverse. Um, the, the APEN uh, Leadership Development Series is a uh, program that we have where we invite senior managers and directors and help them with or train them with executive presence and leadership values. Part of partner pipeline is every year we take a look at a partner pipeline, the diversity advisory board and the functional vice chairs um, of KPMG on an ongoing basis. Take a look at our partner pipeline. Who is coming up to be promoted to partner next year, two years, three years? Who of them are diverse? What type of coaching do they need? Can we get them a coach to help them to get through the threshold? And then the Lead Partner Academy is a program that we have for young partners who are you know, earlier in their career to help them become lead partners for some of our large accounts. And so again, we take a look at some of those um, candidates to make sure that there is diversity. So I'll just. I think that's it. So I'll just wrap up by just ta saying that to us, you know, str it's strategic to us to have diversity and inclusion. It's, and we try to make it a part of our business, of everything that we do, both internally as well as how we deliver to our clients. We still have a long way to go, uh, but I think that um, we are slowly but surely getting to where we want to be yeah. with the help of people like Tori, who's a our diversity director. <laughs> Manali, thank you for that. Um, let me just offer a few thoughts from what I think we just heard. I would expect nothing else from a major global advisory firm, but it's great to see your priorities framework, uh, what you're trying to do. Uh, let's, let's establish what our goals are for this type of a program, and then let's develop the plans or activities to achieve those objectives. That may seem like 101, but I think that's really important for all of us to keep in mind. Um, also, it's not just a focus on the specific community or the employee research uh, resource group unit, but everyone needs to be engaged with these groups. I think that was also a very powerful point. Um, it's not just about one-on-one -on -one mentoring, but developing the mechanisms to enable these target communities with the ability to forge relationships across the enterprise with leaders, with peers, much more broadly. Um, it was great to see your plan of action across all the three stages of recruiting, retention, and talent development. It seems like that is kind of a day one priority at KPMG in terms of making sure that that ecosystem and that approach is there as soon as folks walk over your threshold and, and join the firm. Um, seeking frequent feedback directly from employees. Congratulations and thank you on that. Not just making assumptions in the C-suite based on observations that may themselves come with some unconscious bias by different executives. Um, um, ensuring, I, I loved this, that your key account teams are diverse from the get-go, not just waiting to see if a client asks for that or trying to figure out if it makes sense for that particular client. It's just a universal approach. And then I also loved the consideration of coaching as a very key mechanism for development, not just our uh, is the individual ready? Are the are the individuals ready? But do we think they can be ready? And do we have the opportunity to give them that chance through coaching? So thank you for that very, very detailed overview. We can see why this is our 2017 uh, Employer of the Year for Asian and Asian Pacific American uh, talent. I'd like to turn to Amy Rosen to uh, share with us Telstra's perspective uh, on some of these issues as well. If it comes up. Yeah, there we go. Um, so to understand our journey, Tell about your journey of creating diversity and inclusion. You probably need to understand the traveler. And I'm just wondering, how many people here have heard of Telstra? How many people here have companies who have offices in Asia? Right. So Telstra is an Australian headquartered telecommunications and technology company. We've been around since 1901. And if you know anything about Australia, you know it's a beautiful country, koalas, kangaroos, all those things. Oh, sure. Um, but it also is a country which is a whole country on a continent. And a continent that is very large, but in a sense its population is unlike the US, which, is, which means that Australians always have to be looking beyond their borders and always have to be, to be willing to travel far and to explore other cultures. So Telstra, which has started out as a government-owned telecommunications company, similar to the AT&T store in the US, um, really needed to grow to be something else entirely. And, you know, the first mobile phone call in India was actually carried under Telstra's network. Um, a third of the internet traffic, internet Asia regionally, is actually carried on Telstra's subsea cables because that's what sort of the, the Australians knew that they needed to do to grow and learn. 
which meant they were faced with diversity. When you talk about diversity being a reality, it was immediately a reality, and immediately a reality that they were going, unlike U.S. headquartered companies, they were going into countries which were much larger than theirs in terms of making an impact. At the same way you weight that with, as we all probably know from the traditional telco model, at home, you're everywhere. You're on every billboard, every type of person, no matter where they live, whether they're in hot and humid Darwin or whether they're in um, Perth or Brisbane or Melbourne, they are probably a subscriber. They probably have a bunch of complaints about their phone service, um, but they know you too. So your community, in a sense, domestically is diverse, but very proudly dense with it, and you're coming into another market and being different and not necessarily as large as a U.S. company coming in. Uh, so that sort of spurred us on a journey to understand that diversity was a definite key component of what we would need to deal with, and led us to the necessity, same with you, that from a corporate strategy perspective, inclusion was important. How we started our LP, so our roadmap, which were that sort of our outline for it, was simple when our, in our goals with it, but there were three key pivotal events in 2007 that sort of gave rise to where this all came into and LGBTI particularly became a focus. And the three events were, and I'm also the general counsel in the U.S. business, so this is near and dear to my heart, changes in law and policy. And so the first event was, oh, look, there have been changes in laws. We should re we look at our policies and ensure that they are friendly and inclusive, and here we're going. And, oh, look, there's this reference to marriage. We're going to change that to partnership. We're going to think about the gender pronouns we use so that we are all comfortable. And what happened when you have a large company, as you can imagine, on the ground, what surprised people who were working on these policies were they got a lot of feedback. And not all of it was positive. People were upset about change norms and why we were disrupting things like marriage. And it made people who were working on the policy work think there's something else we need to do here. It's not just about changing words. At that same point, and this keys directly to your strategy point, as I said, we were government owned. In Australia, the deregulation happened a little bit later than in the US where it happened in the 90s, it happened in the 2000s. So we were going from being this, it's comfortable being government owned, um, to wow, we are on our own. We are really gonna have to hone in and develop our strategy specifically. And we developed a strategy which was build a brilliant connected future for everyone. Everyone. So that meant inclusion was a dramatic component of our strategy from the get-go. And what I think separates Telstra a little bit from other companies I've worked at was they took the strategy and their values incredibly seriously. And we had sessions on it, they were adopting what these values were. And at the beginning, I will be honest with you, or that I or that is my background, I was a little bit cynical. That's where people on my team, why are we having this session where we're focusing on like six words? Is this a, you know, a, a jingle communication? But it was really meaningful because these words, the brilliant connected future for everyone, and the five values which are find your courage, show you care, better together, trust each other to deliver, and make the complex simple. Still have problems with that. That's fine. Um, <laughs> those are words that everyone uses all the time. You go into our Jakarta office, they'll tell you those words. You go into our Singapore office, those are the words you hear. And in New York and San Francisco, everyone, your office manager, your person in marketing, your person in sales, and your engineers, they all know it. Now, sometimes they may not all, all five off the top of their head or they'll lose one, but everyone will know that that's our purpose and values. And they're so simple but they're still geared to inclusion and connection, which is what building networks and building technology, more than the tech behind it, it's what are you trying to build from it. So if you look at our goals that we set out, and we did set out with them, the first two sound right on target in terms of focus on LGBT, but the last three, they're really our goals for everything, which is we want the best talent, we want to connect communities and customers, um, and we want our to retain our talent, just like do a KPMJ. Um, so how did we get there? There were sort of three buckets of key elements. One was the community activity. One was the policies, as I've said. Oh, excellent. How about this? Um, one was the community activity. Uh, 
And that was putting our brand all over a lot of things. And it started out in Australia where we had a big presence anyway. So the Midsummer Fe Festival, which is a big LGBT activity, was when we championed. You can get Telstra water bottles, Telstra suntan lotion, anything you can put our brand in, we put our brand on. Um, we also championed, there's a Wear Purple Day, which was a, started through a high school about a, sort of actions against bullying. And it became, it's, it's, it's an Australian thing, but it became global. All of our offices also celebrate Wear a Purple Day, International Day, Day Against Hatred. And everybody started to do that and talk about it. But the third element, which really is sort of the internal community building, that was probably the most critical. And that, I think there was a third catalyst. So I had the policies, I had the change in the strategy. The third catalyst was technology, which is all of a sudden we could connect people through social media. And I know social media is a freighted issue in terms of whether it connects people or divides people. But what I found globally in our company is it connected people and allowed them to tell stories and recognize connections between countries that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. So we started out old school when this first started with email lists, but soon there, which was our spectrum email list, and it was maybe 100 people. But soon it became a social media group because... Unlike other companies, we can't always do our ERGs live. We can do it live in Australia, and they do, but if you're in a 130-person office in the U.S. or you know, a smaller office in Thailand, you no might not necessarily have enough people who are present and diverse who can share that experience. But what we found on Spectrum, and believe me, this last night's event was all over Spectrum, once we had finished uh, photo shopping, is that people, people come out and they tell their stories and they notice that there's a story. They may feel alone in their own experience, but they now have a broader community and platform to work on. The other thing that we soon realized was it's not just about people who identify as LGBTI who are part of that community. I'm a proud Spectrum member and I happen to be heterosexual. It's the answer is you need allies. You need executive allies. You need to understand who they are and they need to tell personal stories. And it's amazing how many stories people have that are inclusive because of family members, because the world is a diverse one regardless of what you do and the power of hearing those personal stories loud and clear. Um, the other tactic, which was a recent one, was guerrilla bombing. So um, our head of HR diversity came with... Um, someone who was transgender and they came to the executive leadership forum with 350 executive lead global leaders and they asked you, would you sign up? And by the end of the conference, everybody was wearing an inclusive t-shirt and they had 160 new more executive sponsors. Being willing to put yourself out there and interrupt for a cause that's good for you and realizing that people are passionate and then they see their peers who are also passionate about those experiences and being advocates for um, that, that, even in an informal gesture, really matters quite a bit. The last thing was really training. So doing our bias-interrupted training sessions really taught us a lot as well. We started in Australia, and we started with the knowledge uh, that a lot of the implicit bias training classes, while interesting, didn't make an impact. People learned about them. They learned they had implicit bias. But then what were the tools to combat it? What did they do? So instead of making it an awareness class, we made it a leadership component class and we did it with live actors and role playing and we did it with workshopping afterwards and action plans built by leaders that they would have to learn how to lead and create an inclusive workplace and what was particularly focused on is do not make these actors act and we had people with all kinds of different diversity characteristics but the important point was do not sugarcoat it Make the employee as difficult as any other employee is. This is not, you know, how do you manage that in that circumstance? Cu you know, carving out your bias and realizing how to deal with it and, and performance manage someone, et cetera, understanding that there may be differences that you may be thinking about, and then there may be performance issues as well. And then they took the show on the road. They've done this in Singapore and Hong Kong and the Philippines. And what they did in those countries is they hired local actors. And when they workshopped, they would oftentimes switch to Cantonese or Mandarin um, because that encourages real conversation because there are cultural differences because the same thing that you've developed in corporate headquarters, it doesn't quite land. It's the fun thing about being a U.S. subsidiary. I realized, oh my gosh, when I was at U.S. headquarters, I made all these assumptions about why isn't the sub doing this? Why don't they understand how important this is? The answer is because it's not the same. Um, so we learned a lot from those sessions and really we are hoping to develop more of them. Um, 
the progress and impact is spectrum that Yammer Group has is just phenomenally large right now in executive allies. Um, what was a really cool takeaway, which we hadn't quite anticipated, is the engagement of our LGBTI-identifying LGBT employees in our Asian markets is higher than that of Telstra employees overall because of the support. So focusing on this one level really connected people in a way that we hadn't quite understood in terms of their loyalty and belief in the company and its vision. Um, and also, yeah, it's not a bad branding thing, too. It's what we believe in, so why not be associated with it? Um, what were we surprised by? I think at the beginning we focused a lot on structure, and then we were surprised how the personal stories, the Yam, sorry, that's our social media platform, the Microsoft Yammer platform, you know, how much that mattered, how much the personal story mattered in terms of getting people behind the cause. People who sometimes, you know, you had people who were concerned or who felt their religious beliefs would not support LGBTI inclusion. Some people had country's laws that didn't. When you talked about the personal story, when you broke it down to this is Barb and this is her story about it, people felt more connected to it on a local level. I know, and Ali is my country operations manager, for us, we were looking for an advocate for LGBTI um, in our region. And we were surprised that our LGBTI identified employees weren't raising their hands to do it. But we found the person who was most passionate about leading this was also happened to be heterosexual. But, you know, she told a personal story about a family member that just moved so many people to volunteer, to sign up, and we're doing a major event with Pride um, because she cared about it so much and made it so meaningful to everyone. So people didn't feel that they were, you know, opting into something that they didn't believe in. Um, the other surprise finding was Asia in general, which was we did a survey to find out people, if they wanted to, could voluntarily identify. And we found in the Philippines, 31% of our hundreds of employees identified as LGBTI, much higher than the U.S. or Australia or EMEA. We found, you know, Singapore, 11.9%. So we realized that there were things we needed to learn and understand about other countries in other ways that we hadn't thought of by focusing on diversity and inclusion. Our future is a little bit more of the same, but really drilling down into the local markets, really focusing on not trying to headquarters this thing to death and understand what are the needs of the communities which we serve and how can employees who are passionate about these change and morph and in their empowered to deliver show your care way, help build the next sort of step in the journey. Amy, thank you so much. Um, I think thank you for offering a non-American corporate perspective uh, and experience. I think that's always important for, for, for us to hear. Um, a great reminder that embracing diversity and inclusion is not always without its lumps, that change uh, isn't universally embraced, and so strategies are certainly needed to, to surmount that. Um, I loved the reminder that six words can matter, uh, that it's really worth the time investment in establishing norms and values and even words to describe those norms and values that can be embraced. Uh, by a company, uh, the catalyst of technology, whether it's social media, email list, etc. What a great uh, idea that uh, uh, it's really through technology that we can enable pow the powerful virtual communities that are multi-office or multi-geography uh, that can be very helpful. The importance of allies, uh, just another reminder of, of, of that critical element. Um, and then certainly appreciate the need for diversity in terms of an approach that enables an inclusive approach at a multinational company, not just pushing the concept through the lens of headquarters, uh, that sometimes this has got to be a multifaceted effort and it may be a little bit different in different markets, uh, but that is what it takes to achieve the overall goal. So thank you for that. Um, Austin, looking forward to hearing about Credit Suisse. We'll see if your lavalier mic is teed up, and if not, I'm going to pass the microphone over to you. Great. Hi. Uh, my name is Austin Fernandez. Uh, the good part of going third in a panel discussion is you can draw down on the collective wisdom of two people before you. The not so great part is all your prescripted remarks are out of the window. <laughs> You've got to make it up on the fly. So, um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm here from Credit Suisse. Um, I think I echo a lot of what uh, Amy and Manolet said. Uh, we are a large investment bank and a global bank uh, with global presence. Um, 
And diversity and inclusion is not just a way of life. It actually makes proper business sense. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's fundamental. It's core to our, it's a core value. It's a core, it's a core part, an essential part of our strategy. Uh, having said that, I mean, you know, I just wanted to reiterate re- re- uh, that the APN network that I, I, I'm here to speak about, the Asian Professionals Network, is one of eight diversity networks, similar to what Manila said. Uh, we have an LGBT community. We have a network for... Uh, veterans, um, um, black professionals, Latino Americans, uh, and we also have the Asian Professionals Network. Uh, So I'll just talk a little bit about our journey over the last uh, six years since its inception, uh, where we were, where we are, uh, some of the challenges uh, that we believe we've helped overcome, and looking a little bit forward as to what our next steps are, especially this year where we launch a, a new sponsorship initiative, and we can talk a little, little bit about that in, a, uh, in more detail. So, um, so we started our Asian Professionals Network in 2010 with a focus on IT. Uh, with a global presence, uh, we, we found a lot of our technologists um, actually uh, uh, were, were of Asian background, and we believed that having reviewed uh, and uh, looked at the uh, in, at the career progression we thought we needed to do a little bit more in being able to expand um, and grow uh, that talent through, through the organizational rungs uh, having succe- successfully completed that mission or uh, worked in completing that mission we actually expanded our our network into a business network in 2015 uh, where we actually crossed over from just a technology network into a business and technology network. The, the goal there was to be able to um, cross, um, uh, cross leverage a lot of the good work that we were doing on both sides of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, firm. Uh, the mission statement is consistent with the mission statement that we have for other networks in the firm, uh, support the bank's effort to attract, develop, and retain talent. Uh, facilitate personal growth through mentorship programs uh, and also networking op- opportunities. I think you, you spoke a lot about networking. I think this is a business where networks, people are really, really, really critical. Having the right contacts, the right context at the right time is really, really essential. And I think an opportunity for a network is to be able to foster and expand uh, a, a person's uh, influence in the organization. And last but not least, we wanted to create a community, uh, again, a mini community within the broader community that we call Credit Suisse, where we could share, uh, exchange ideas and knowledge uh, and be able to foster cross-cultural com- uh, communication. The network in its first five years focused a lot on, on leadership series, mentorship series, uh, a lot of uh, philanthropic events, awareness events, uh, also a lot of cultural events. We actually just, uh, you know, we, we have a an Asian Heritage Month. This we celebrate Asian Heritage Month in May. We have a flagship event where we have a, a, you know, a, a, a kickoff uh, of, the, of a month-long um, set of series, whether speaker series or leadership series. But we also have a cultural series where we have everything from a lion dance to a face mask uh, program to a, uh, a Bollywood dance or a, or, or a classical uh, recital uh, as part of a cultural program. Uh, so it's, it's again, uh, bringing about a community uh, and creating an environment where uh, you can learn and leverage from each other's talent. Uh, last but not least, I mean, I think we, we have developed a, a series of initiatives uh, over the last few years uh, in being able to grow um, our talent pool, um, again, going back to the theme of retaining and, and, and advancing uh, people's careers. I think it's really, really important for us to be able to link people to the right mentors and mentee relationships, uh, both formally and informally, uh, to be able to get them through... Um, through tough times in their careers, difficult questions, um, guidance and advice on uh, next steps and where they are, uh, or just sometimes just um, uh, ideas uh, on how to solve a problem. So our focus areas, I mean, I think when I, when I, when I, when I was presenting or preparing for this presentation, I think uh, one thing I drew back on is a conversation we had with the sender uh, about six to eight months ago. And uh, I think this, this slide on the left, which is... Um, it's quite, um, it's quite insightful because it shows um, where Asians typically at executive and managerial levels are typically less, uh, um, uh, 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 there's a glass ceiling factor that's much, much, many multiples um, higher than um, uh, uh, just, just women. Now, what I found even more amazing was women, Asian women have it even harder 
than um, than women overall. So I think it's, it was really, really insightful. Uh, I think we, we, we surveyed our our Asian population. I think one of the questions we asked, and we have a survey that goes out every year, um, um, similar to the other panelists, uh, where we ask about what are the things that we would like from our, our community uh, to start looking uh, and start doing differently. And one of the answers was more investment in business development, direct interaction with senior managers in the firm, uh, and also, I think, our APN Senior Advisory Board uh, looking top-down. So we did a bottom-up, top-down exercise. Uh, and the top-down view was pretty much the same. Our senior managers in our, in our advisory board uh, also wanted to invest more time in being able to uh, have one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many uh, conversations with uh, up-and-coming talent within the, within the organization. Um, so on that basis, we... we, we uh, on the, uh, we, we kicked off this uh, initiative called the Sponsorship Initiative. It's actually basically three things. Uh, is identifying uh, participants from our APN community uh, that are pretty much on the cusp of a VP to director um, uh, 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 title within the organization, uh, senior roles within the organization, uh, pair them up with a senior sponsor, uh, pair them up also with a coach and advisor during the, the, uh, the, uh, the one-year program that we have, uh, and last but not least, in that mentorship program and the coaching uh, process, be able to identify skills and gaps that are that are maybe tailored to that individual or maybe tailored to the uh, to the broad, broader community itself. So, uh, a three pronged approach to being able, able to um, to advance and help someone learn and grow through the organization. Um, the structure, uh, just a little bit, I mean, I think this is a little bit of the what and the how rather than the what. Uh, we have the participants, uh, anyone from the APN group or even actually outside of the APN group um, it could be a participant in the program. Uh, for, you know, just for this year itself, we've, we've start, we wanted to start small. I mean, I think that was one of the feedback and lessons that we learned from, the, from, our, from discussing it with our, with our partners and other diversity in, and networks, is to start small and, 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 and grow, the, grow the program. So we've, we've tapped a few people within the, uh, within the participant list, and the group is now working with, is paired up with a sponsor uh, who's a senior, uh, we have everyone from the CIO of the organization to the CTO uh, for, for the Americas, who, uh, uh, some business side representation as well. So it's a, a broad group of people uh, who are sponsors, uh, who've identified a set of projects that are within their, within their remit, uh, and paired uh, the participants with people in their organization who help dra uh, drive those projects for them. So the goal here is make, basically be able to um, link participants with sponsors with the ultimate goal for the sponsor to be an actual sponsor for that participant. So help grow their network, but actually uh, not just make this a, mentor, a, mentorship, a mentorship relationship, but it's make it a, a sponsorship relationship. Uh, the coaches are primarily members of the APN leadership team. Uh, the, the primary objective there is to be, given the seniority of the, um, of the sponsors, be able to act as a bridge for uh, the participant um, so the, the conversations are more direct, they, you know, there's less of an intimidation factor, there's more coaching involved um, in the nature of the, of the project work that they're doing. And finally, um, in, in, as, part of that, uh, as part of that process, we're able to identify skills and, and gaps that need to be addressed as part of, the, as part of that process. Um, it, like I said, this is a 12-month program. The first six months, uh, first three months were all about initiation, getting the right, um, the right sponsors, the right uh, participants, uh, getting them matched up. Uh, but the next six months are more about uh, defining what the, each of the customized pr uh, programs for the sponsors and the, and the mentees would be, and an execution phase where over the next three to four months, uh, the program is, is completed ex uh, with an execution uh, and an evaluation phase where the uh, the participant gets feedback directly from the sponsor and uh, uh, from the from their coach. Last but not least, a little bit about uh, you know as as we've increased our APN uh, membership and we've crossed over from from technology to business, what we realized is we we have over a thousand employees now in in America across multiple sites uh, that are part of the network. Um, the mix of uh, and this is actually what we a lesson learned when we were pure technology. Uh, network before we became a business network, we were 100% technology. We now find ourselves at a 60-40 technology and business mix, which I think is uh, quite reflective of, of, of the kind of problems, common problems that uh, a network like this uh, helps solve. Um, second, we've, you know, I think 
not a complete surprise, but I think uh, you know the the overwhelming response we've had from the senior uh, senior senior members of the of the firm um, in being able to support and sponsor and, and dedicate time to the to the network has been uh, quite remarkable. Uh, like I said, we've had an increase in membership uh, by over seventy percent. We're now a thousand person organization. Um, and we also, in addition to the sponsorship uh, in, um, initiative, we also participate uh, or create programs like negotiation skills, communication skills, things we believe are fundamental to, uh, to the network and, uh, and, and to our participants. So I'd like to close there. I mean, uh, you know, I think uh, we, uh, you know, I, like I, I think I'll, like I'll close by saying I think diversity and inclusion is really, really um, a key part of our strategy, a key part of our, our values. And uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, like I said, I started, uh, it's a key part of our business uh, goals. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Thank you for offering uh, the details of the journey, you know, that your network has really undergone at Credit Suisse. I think the fact that you all took the time to measure the reality of your management pipeline, making sure that the effort was understandably worth it, but maybe exactly how uh, you would steer it. Um, the fact that under the sponsorship initiative, you know, so interesting that it's tied to the execution of a stretch assignment. It's not just conversation and networking, although we all, I think, know the power of that sort of a, a atmosphere creation as well. Uh, giving us some food for thought about you know sponsorship over mentorship or how the two are intertwined or, or, or similar or different. Um, and then I loved the goal of personal brand development, and Richard Louis certainly would have liked that too. It seems to make this sponsorship uh, initiative very personal, and I would imagine would make the employees going through it feel like this is very much about them and not just you know that they're employees moving through a process and they're going to get a certificate at the end of uh, the year or whatnot, but it's very much tied to true development. So so thank you very much for that. Um, we do have some time for some questions, and I've not only been typing up these points, but making a little bit of, of some things that I'll certainly follow up with our panelists uh, in my own time. But let's go ahead and hear from the audience. It is on. Check. So we have um, stretch assignments from both business sponsors and technology sponsors. Uh, an example would be uh, we're working on some dashboards right now, um, and the and the sponsor basically believes that he, you know they he wants an external view, a um, an independent opinion on what those dashboards look like, what the client experience for those dashboards should be, and those are internal clients. Uh, and he feels um, the need to have a, you know, someone who's senior enough to be able to provide that independent advice. That would be an example of a, of a stretch assignment. So someone coming in with very little background on the, on the, on the dashboarding capabilities and provide the insight uh, uh, and, uh, and help develop that dashboard functionality further. Thank you. Um, you guys have all spoken about the different networks that you have for the Asian community. Uh, are there any metrics that you have probably for, you know, has it really helped in retention and promotion of the employees through the executive levels? You know, the work that you all are doing, which is fantastic. And I think the second is, to Kristen's point, how do you make the employees feel engaged in this? How do you get them to have some ownership or engagement within the community so that they don't feel like it's something more the company is just doing for the sake of doing? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the connect, how do you make the, feel, the employees feel engaged because that really has been a surprising element. I, th I think the answer is social media is a good pathway to it, which I am, I'm not on Facebook, yes I am on LinkedIn, but I'm, I'm not advocating this, I, and we have no stake in it, so it's not that I'm selling this. Um, but that's a place for people to plan across that casually. If you ask at a corporate meeting, and I've done this, like, oh, we should start this, would you be interested in doing this? Everyone looks at me in a frozen face, and it's a funny thing to have to ask also. The women stuff, I tend to be able to foment some drive on that, but it's hard to say to someone, oh, you look like diverse, why don't you lead this initiative on whatever it is? So I think social media, that's where more and more, especially with 
millennials, et cetera, as we're more and more accustomed to dealing casually and comfortably and dipping our toe into things, that's a good place to allow opinions, to put a question out there and allow opinions to build about what should we do next? What would you like to see? I've also done survey monkeys, but just a place where people can dabble into it to show you their points as opposed to really asking someone to lead an initiative. So that, that element of the question about how do you engage employees, we found giving them a platform where you can comfortably speak about what you like or don't like about what the company's doing was really effective. Hey, I'd like to just comment on the, um, can you hear me? Okay. I'd just like to comment on your question about or your point about uh, measures. Um, I'd be lying if I told you that at KPMG we have very detailed uh, and, and robust, uh, sophisticated measures. But we do have a, a web-based uh, KPI uh, tool that we use, uh, and we use it more at a high level right now. It's really to track um, our, the diversity of our top talent um, and to track the diversity of our leaders. But I think that there's some ways to go uh, to uh, measure other things. So right now, predominantly, I'd say that uh, when, we, when it comes to measuring how our people feel, we use our surveys for that, our annual survey. Okay, uh, this is Ram Kumpati, MasterCard. Um, some of the global uh, companies that KPMG and, and you mentioned, um, some of the challenges that I see is what's, what diversity means to different companies across the globe, right? Um, what it means to a local division, if you will, right? It, it changes. And so how do you tackle the, I guess, the cultural barriers of what diversity means and, and especially when it, they contradict each other in different regions? I think the answer is carefully. You know, so when I said we, did a, we do a survey of employees, we don't do that survey in UAE, we don't do it in Malaysia, because we know that the governments, you know, we got legal advice, we know the governments could get access to that information, it would be dangerous for employees. Is it horrible that that's the case? It absolutely is, but not to acknowledge it is to misunderstand it. Interestingly enough, in Singapore also, um, there are laws against, there are laws against, and it was explained to me, which was a subtlety I hadn't understood, because I said, why does it seem that there is actually a thriving LGBTI population in Singapore if it's illegal? They said, no, no, acts are illegal, but the orientation isn't illegal. And the nuance is one I haven't fully explored, but it really sort of led us to understand that you can't make assumptions and you really need to act, ask people who are there, but you need to be you need to be committed to your purpose. So especially in LGBTI TI is particularly sensitive um, in that area. Um, I think companies are more likely to understand, well, I'm going to be sensitive about, you know, I'm going to hold true to my purpose on gender, regardless of where I am and regardless of the situation. You know, that's universally. LGBTI is actually not fully there yet globally in terms of how people play with that, so, you know, and, and, and think in that field. But I think you have to start it with the premise of, this is what we believe is right, this is what we would support, and come back to the, what if they were telling me that I couldn't have any people of this particular race or, or any person of, you know, of this particular gender doing something? How would I approach that? So stay committed to the principle of it, but then approach the local leaders. Uh, in at Telstra, we have country managing directors, which, as you can tell from my accent, not an Australian accent, um, that tend to be locally recognized who will point out to you and build up communities who will say, this isn't landing. We don't understand that. Sometimes we make mistakes all the time. We stumble on it. But I think the important thing is being humble and asking the questions. And getting, obviously, in truly sensitive countries, if it's LGBTI, getting legal advice in terms of what could harm your employees by taking a stance on it. We, as one of those things said, we were a big sponsor of Pink Dot in Hong Kong and in Singapore last year, government just came out and said that they wouldn't allow any foreign corporations, or foreign-owned corporations, to have participants in, Sing in Singapore this year. So we'll have to change for this year and, and go with that, because obviously we wouldn't want to imperil any, they would say they would rest, and you don't want to imperil anyone, but I think it's just trying to constantly keep being aware that every market is different.
So let me just ask one question, and each of you can maybe take a, a quick stab at, at answering. Um, we've certainly heard a lot today about uh, the that there's really no end to slicing and dicing, uh, you know, employee segments and whatnot. Um, certainly, with respect to Asian or Asian Pacific American employees, uh, there's not a mon monolithic cultural similarity, uh, let alone factors like gender, age, generation, et cetera. So how do your approaches uh, to promoting diversity take this diversity into account as you're developing programs and, and, uh, and other things? Why is everyone looking at me? I, <laughs> <laughs> I, left to right. I know, I thought we all had to answer it. Uh, the intersectionality question in general, and you know, we focus in our women network, that's a huge issue. And especially as we're, so many people don't identify as one level of diversity anyway, and in your population in terms of how to do it. I think that gets to the personal stories is how we try to do it. At the, you know, I was so earnest when we started in the US on this journey, and Ali will tell you where I'm like, what are we doing about this level of diversity, and how do we get more elements of it? You know, how do we force, it. And the answer is, y you can't. So you have to just try to create things to tell each other's story. One really goofy way of where we deal with intersectionality and, and sort of differences, we have International Food Day. Food is a really good connector, <laughs> um, especially in a little office. And in our small office of in New York, I think we're less than 50 people, when we put out the food, we have about 35 different flags. Which is shocking, because you realize all these people are just like, and that's the beauty of the U.S. too. And 100% participation in food. And 100% participation on food. Food is one that you can get. That is my one, if that's the takeaway from this. If you have an event and you put food out, it's shocking how many people will show. <laughs> and how many people are actually excellent cooks also is another thing. So, and people like to explore through food, and people are proud of food. So that was a good way for me, whether you're like, oh, I didn't know Lumpia was from the Philippines, or I didn't know there was this bitter soup, you know, from, you know, the Caribbean that someone who I associate as African American isn't African American. They're actually Caribbean American and saying this is, you know, a whole different concept of it. I think thinking events of events like social media, like having personal events, like you were saying also inclusion, which is, and I, I like that visual, which is if you have an inclusive, the answer is we all around this room, we have, may have a few things in common. We've got tons of interesting differences. We're just seeing the tip of the iceberg if we just focus, and that's stolen from one of our many <laughs> symposium lectures, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of what makes us different and also what connects us. So the more that we can explore through personal stories, whether we're doing something with veterans um, for Memorial Day, someone told us a, an amazing story of a connection and why her feelings for it, the more we can have storytelling and authentic storytelling going on at corporate meetings, going on when you come to strategic innovation, the more it encourages people to speak out and fight against ceilings that may stop them from naturally participating. At least that's the best advice I got. Well, Amy, thank you for jumping on that. <laughs> um, but I just, uh, I just wanted to comment on, on, on the question. I think it's, um, I think the value, the values having the, the, um, the core value of appreciating differences and respect is the way you deal with it. Um, as you said, you know, if you have that core value of accepting and appreciating differences through inclusion, respecting um, the differences of everyone, and understanding that actually that there is power in that, that's how you actually deal with the differences. For me, I think it's a journey. I mean, I think for you know, I've been with the firm long enough, and I saw, you know, five years, six years ago, we had four or five diversity networks. It's now up to eight. Um, and I think trying to get the cross-section between, you know, all of these networks is, is something that I think is an evolutionary phase. Uh, but you have, to, you have to go through the journey, but I think it's a fair point. You have to, it has to be part of your core mission statement, core values, and part of your strategy. And once it's ingrained in your DNA, I think uh, it becomes a lot more easier. It's never easy, it becomes easier. Please join me in thanking our panelists, Manalite, Amy, and Austin.